Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining the Okta Advanced Server Access webcast today. I'm John Bartz with NCSI, and with me today is Brian Hodzik, CTO of NCSI as well, and Ivan Dwyer, Product Manager at Okta, joining us from San Francisco today. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Advanced Server Access is a brand new product. Ivan, you just launched this at your annual Okta kickoff this month. Tell us more about this acquisition and the new offering here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for that uh, introduction. Really happy to be here, both the, both you, John and Brian. I'm excited because I get to talk about something new, uh, as John mentioned, a uh, new product to Okta, which we unveiled to our internal team just last week at our uh, annual sales kickoff in Las Vegas. And we are planning to now launch it to the public at our uh, annual user conference coming up in April. So everyone here gets a preview of a new Okta product. And I'm going to talk about uh, the themes and, and trends that are surrounding this, this new, new acquisition and new product that we're bringing to market. But it also occurred to me that I didn't want to gloss over the fact that Okta might be new to some of the folks uh, that are watching this today. So I just want to give a very brief introduction to, to who Okta is. Um, that'll lead into the topic that we're going to talk about today. Um, but Okta is an identity company. We just celebrated our 10-year anniversary uh, this past month, uh, really, really uh, driving towards modern cloud trends in identity. And uh, that means that we, we want to enable businesses to, to use any technology that they want to use with a unified identity layer. Um, and, I'm, and I'm abstracting a lot of the complexities around managing disparate identity stores uh, in on-prem environments to uh, a cloud service that can be easily consumed and shared uh, across the entire workforce or even your customer identity. And that's, uh, that's where we are today is the identity cloud. And there's really three areas of, of focus. We focus on workforce identity. So this is solutions for your internal uh, employees, contractors, partners who need uh, as, you know, single sign-on secure access to business applications such as Salesforce, Box, Dropbox, Slack, uh, you name it. Uh, we also do customer identity, so we offer developer tools uh, for application developers to build in uh, identity solutions into their own applications. So taking away a lot of the complexities of having to build authentication, authorization, uh, things that, you know, not necessarily you want to sp spend a ton of development cycles on. Uh, you just want a kind of a, a stable platform that can handle that. We offer that. And then what I want to talk about today is, is this identity-centric approach to uh, a, a new emerging trend in IT and security around zero trust. And we'll talk about how that uh, is emerging as kind of the modern dominant architecture for organizations investing in cloud. And as you can see, we have a lot of, a lot of customers and we're growing super fast, which is really exciting stuff. So from on the workforce side, which is really what we want to focus on uh, today, is we have a number of products that we offer. Uh, we started as a single sign-on company, but have evolved over time uh, to offer a full directory with lifecycle management capabilities and then, you know, uh, more MFA for more secure environments, securing your, your most sensitive company resources. Now, what we're going to talk about today is a new product in this workforce identity product suite, taking a lot of what Okta does for securing access to business applications to the infrastructure layer, which is an entirely new area of, t of territory for Okta. It's something that companies struggle with, uh, securing access to on-prem servers, cloud servers, uh, databases, the, the really sensitive infrastructure resources that administrators need access to to do their job. And this is what we're going to focus on today. But first, I kind of want to set up zero trust because this is kind of emerging as this new security architecture that represents how companies operate today. The idea of the network perimeter where you've got the office that you badge into and you can only access resources within that perimeter is starting to fade because we see more cloud adoption, we see more mobile usage, we, we see more remote employees and contractors and partners who all need to access infrastructure applications and APIs in real time from outside of that perimeter. And just bolstering the perimeter security, which is what a lot of companies have tried to do over the past decade to solve for this, hasn't really worked. And we're seeing it break down because the idea is you can't just assume trust once you're in a network the network is not necessarily the right binary control point where you're saying, I now trust this person. And we'll, we'll talk about why that is. But what, when we look at it from Okta's perspective, if we're removing trust from the network, we have to place it somewhere. And if we look at it from how the employees, partners, and contractors access the resources, 
The idea is that people really are the new perimeter because they're the ones you want to you know, manage and control access to those resources. So if you make people the new perimeter, that kind of changes how you think about controlling access and managing access and building out uh, architectures to support the workforce. So let's just go through a few things of what this means when we decide, when we say that people are the new perimeter. First, we want to lay identities as the groundwork. And the, when we say that the network perimeter is breaking down, that means we have to shift controls elsewhere. And the most effective way to do that is to shift controls from the network layer to the application layer, because we now have a, more, a better idea of who the user is, what device they're on, what you know, location they're coming from, what, what the policies are. We can make much smarter non-binary decisions at this application layer. And with all of that contextual information, we can just be much smarter about when we grant access, when we deny access, or when we step up uh, another additional factor in an authentication workflow because we have more context than just the network. We have all of this user information, device state, network location, uh, physical location, uh, application policies, all of this stuff comes together and really makes a, a secure kind of policy enforcement layer. And then when we talk about authenticating to services, it's not a one-time check-in. We want to continually authenticate and authorize requests in real time and taking that contextual information uh, and then you know, using that to be smart about how we let people in to the services they need to do to do their job. So this is where we're talking about zero trust. And this is all kind of coming together as this modern architecture. Now, what I want to talk about, focus on today is an acquisition that Okta made in this space in July. So I was a member of this company, Scale of T. We were a small startup here in San Francisco, really working on the next generation of access management, uh, focused specifically on infrastructure access. So SSH and RDP were, were our, our, our bread and butter. Now, when we talk about this acquisition, uh, I like to point to two key trends uh, that make this, that, the, why this acquisition makes sense. The first, we talked about it already, this emergence of zero trust is this dominant security architecture for any modern organization operating in the cloud. But the second, which is more product oriented and what we're gonna kind of showcase today uh, live is this convergence of all of these disparate access and identity and access systems under a single control plane. So instead of having a bunch of separate access management products or uh, you know, hack together scripts for controlling access to these servers, controlling access to these applications, these databases, we wanna try to unify that as best we possibly can. And when you have identity done right, which is Octus bread and butter, the ability to extend a central control plane for all access is that natural extension of what we do at Okta from an identity and access management standpoint. So that's how this acquisition started. That was about, I guess, eight months now. Uh, we've spent the past uh, few months selectively selling this new product inside of the Okta install base, gearing up for a very exciting product launch uh, in April at our uh, Octane user conference. Um, so I would suggest if anyone's an Okta customer, um, you know, if you can make it out to San Francisco for that user conference, it's going it's to be massive. Um, I'm very excited to be able to launch a new product inside of a company like Okta, and our customers are already extremely excited about the, the prospects of being able to extend what they know and love about core Okta to the infrastructure layer. Now, let's first talk about why we even need a new approach to infrastructure access. This is an age-old uh, use case. Uh, it comes with a, a, a myriad of challenges that any IT and security professional ha has probably dealt with. And if I were to break it down to kind of one fundamental challenge, it's the credential mechanism for accessing servers. So the SSH keys, the RDP passwords that, that people have in their possession uh, to access servers, they're very dangerous. Uh, they hold privileges in themselves because they're just a static credential. Um, there's no real tie to an identity. Uh, I always say possession is 100% of the law when you talk about the keys. And it's really challenging to deal with provisioning uh, accounts, who has access to what, just kind of keeping a track of inventory of all the keys that are out there. One thing I like to ask our customers is, you know, what happens if a, if a server administrator leaves the company? Uh, you know, oftentimes that means you have to manually go into those machines, disable their accounts, clean up their keys. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a painful process. So, you know, out of this uh, has borne an entire product category and, and a, a series of best practices for protecting those keys. 
And a lot of this is either checking them in to a vaulting service, uh, having some sort of rotation policy, or having a way to ass uh, uh, assign them to shared accounts. Now, these methods are significantly better than managing keys yourself. However, they're still kind of fundamentally rooted in the notion of the credential holding the privilege to do the action. It's still not a very close tie to identity, and those, those credentials can still be misused. They can still be lost. It's not a very modern zero trust uh, approach to it because it has no clear link to, to identity. It's, it's still a lot of shared accounts and shared passwords. So when we think about zero trust and we think about what we actually want to accomplish from an infrastructure access perspective, we really want to take away the value of that credential. And the best way to take away value from a static credential is to only use credentials once. And I call them ephemeral credentials, and we'll actually see this live in action in the product. But we want things to be very tightly scoped to every time I'm SSHing into a server, I want a scoped credential to that login. And then I want that credential to immediately expire after it's used. That eliminates all the cleanup, all of the things that you're, you have to worry about with managing credentials and shared accounts. Get that, clear that out in one fell swoop just by limiting that value of the credential. And then all the things we talked about in terms of continuous authentication, injecting contextual information uh, into access decisions, we can do more effectively when we're not dealing with shared, shared accounts and shared uh, credentials. Um, and then to deal with just the explosion of cloud, uh, we want this all to be automated uh, and exposed as APIs. Now this is no trivial task by any means, uh, but this was a lot of what ScaleFT you know, built in our bread and butter, which we're bringing now to Okta. So I'm very excited to introduce to you folks uh, Okta Advanced Server Access. This is a new product to the Okta portfolio suite. Really, at the end of the day, it's zero trust access for infrastructure that just works. I know that's a, that's a buzzword uh, that sounds very marketing-y, but we have a lot of customer uh, evidence where once they deploy it and they automate it and they, they configure it and the automation takes over, everything just works. All the credentials are cleaned up, the accounts are managed, and they just, they call it magic. It's customers' words, not mine. I'm just reporting what customers say. <laughs> um, the product works for Linux and Windows over SSH and RDP. We, uh, we extend uh, uh, the same platform for AWS, GCP, and Azure, so you can abstract a lot of those complexities around cloud IAM uh, under a single control plane. And then, again, we talked about the architecture. We're gonna just going to eliminate credential and account management pain and then try to get this automated into your DevOps environments uh, without compromising on security one bit. So when, when would we use this? Uh, there's really, the primary use cases are, are, are pretty clear. Um, I'm accessing cloud infrastructure. So on AWS, that might be, I need secure access to my EC2 instances. I don't wanna be using the AWS credentials to do that because they're very dangerous. Uh, this all hooks into my local SSH and RDP tools, integrates with Okta for secure authentication and authorization. Uh, similarly, on the automation side, uh, the product works very well for automating, uh, you know, DevOps uh, workflows like your, your continuous integration, continuous deployment uh, workflows that need to use SSH as a transport, uh, but would traditionally use a shared key uh, to do the work it needs to do. We're going to eliminate that shared key and, and give you a one-time credential. So if your Jenkins server needs to run a build and push, push to production, uh, a production web server, we can do that in a very secure, automated fashion uh, that doesn't require uh, any credentials. Uh, those are really the two primary use cases that we're, we're talking about with this product, and it really hooks in very nicely with Core Okta. So if you're, I, if you're not familiar with some of the Okta services, I can, I can kind of speak to these. Um, this has traditionally been done for business applications, but we're, we're now taking it to infrastructure. But Universal Directory, uh, that is the directory of users and groups. That becomes the single source of truth for your server accounts. Uh, and then we have a lifecycle management product that will automatically provision and deprovision those local accounts all the way from Okta to the machines. So the local machine account is actually tied to an Okta account. If somebody is removed from a group or leaves the company, that gets picked up automatically and reflected on the servers near instantly, which is pretty slick capability. And then on the authentication side, we're extending single sign-on workflows that people are very used to, uh, Okta customers are used to for web applications. We're doing that with SSH and RDP now. And then we have an MFA product to uh, inject more contextual access controls into server authentication workflows. Uh, so you can do step-up uh, multi-factor, uh, you can do 
sign-up policies that, that factor in device posture, device state uh, into some of, these, some of these authentication workflows. And when, when we break it down, this is a really complex topic, uh, but if you have any familiarity with Okta, uh, we try to just make things simple for, for the workforce to access the resources they need to, to do their job. We're doing that at the infrastructure layer, which is extremely exciting, and we'll actually get to see this live in one second. Um, instead of showing you how it works on a slide, let's just pop in uh, here and show the demo. Brian, do you want to jump in and ask any questions while I transition to the demo? Yeah, thanks, Ivan. So just a reminder, maybe some of the people that joined late, um, we can't hear you, so please use that uh, question and answer box. Uh, type out your question there. We want to keep this very interactive and, uh, you know, have a discussion. So please use that Q&A as we go along, uh, and we'll try and answer the questions. Um, we have one question here. Does this product work only with Octo, or what if I use another identity provider? Ah, that's a good question. So when, when ScaleFT was an independent company, we supported any, any IDP. Um, and that was part of our authentication workflow. Since we've been at Okta, we've, we're focusing most of our investments uh, it, with Okta as the backing identity provider. However, can continue to support uh, other IDPs that support SAML uh, or OIDC. Um, so if you have different directories, we can definitely work with, work with you to get that in. Uh, of course, we're going to promote Okta as, uh, as, the, as the right directory to use. Uh, with this product, you can bring in any third-party directory into Okta as a source, where Okta then becomes the master universal directory. Um, but of course, we understand that that's not the case for every customer, so we will continue to support uh, additional IDPs. Okay, great. One more question here. Uh, can you explain the ephemeral? What does that really mean uh, yep. as it relates to those keys or certificates? Great. We'll see this live. Um, what I will say is, um, so the we, we, we call them ephemeral credentials. That's kind of a marketing term. So the technical term is they are client certificates. So OpenSSH or X509 client certificates that we run a certificate authority uh, as part of our platform, but not your traditional certificate authority where you might think of uh, like with web applications. Uh, because these certificates, they, they have a very limited scope. So every time a, a request is authenticated and authorized, so it must be both authenticated and authorized, the certificate will mint uh, the certificate authority will mint a client certificate that has the scope of the user account in Okta, the device, um, which we'll see how the, the device posture comes into play, and then to the specific server being accessed. And then it has a, a TTL of three minutes by default, uh, which is really enough time for our platform to mint that client certificate, deliver it back to the user's client workstation and then use that to, to initiate a secure uh, session with the target resource. Now, three minutes is configurable. The reason we landed on three minutes is to account for things like clock drift on the servers. Uh, what, we didn't want, what we wouldn't want you to do is to go through all that uh, authentication workflow and hand you a certificate that was already expired because the clocks were off. So three minutes felt like an appropriate window. Um, they are immediately rendered useless after they've been, uh, they expire. And within that scope, the only way it could be used would be if you had full machine takeover, um, because it is scoped to the device that, uh, the, that the user is running uh, the scale T client. So does that mean that the user, even if they have that certificate, are able to grab that, they can't ever reuse that again? Correct. Um, so our certificate authority is, you know, doesn't have things like a, a root of trust, um, doesn't have CRLs, um, because really it's just there to, to mint these very, very short-lived one-time use certificates. So the, the actual cryptographic properties are, are not as important as the scope. They're still important. It is still a certificate that, that carries uh, a, you know, information that can be used to authenticate, but it is more important that we limit their, their scope and time uh, to kind of make them ephemeral uh, in nature versus a static SSH key, which carries near infinite <laughs> uh, you know, security posture. And that's really a, a key um, property of, of this product is, is to kind of minimize the, the attack surface of the credential as, as minimal as possible. But we understand that, you know, getting it to, getting it to zero, we want to get to near zero. <laughs> that's, uh, that's kind of the, the, the talk track on, on that when we talk about the credentials. But I can actually show it live, so we'll, uh, we'll see how it gets used. Good. Were there any other questions or were those that... Nope, two? no more. Perfect. 
Okay, so I just want to briefly talk about Okta. If you've never seen Okta before, uh, let's say I work for ATKO Group. Uh, I would log in to my Okta tenant. This is the end user experience, and I have the applications that are available to me. This, uh, this is a demo tenant, so I've only got a few. Uh, maybe if I actually go to my Okta tenant, you can see that I've got all these applications. This is okta.okta.com. When I log in, if I want to get to Coupa, if I want to get to Concur, I can just single sign on through here. But we'll just we'll stick with the demo tenant for now. And uh, but most of the work is done in the admin interface. But if, from a server perspective, um, I sh should call out that you know we're talking about Okta Advanced Server Access as the product. It is still branded as ScaleUpT. You are getting a preview. Um, but this preview is is available to all Okta customers today. Uh, so anyone can go into their Okta admin and add ScaleUpT as an application. And scale of T will be the, uh, a separate dashboard. This is being rebranded as Okta Advanced Server Access. So you're getting a preview, uh, which is exciting stuff. Now, if I were to, as an administrator of Okta, I could go into the scale of T application and I could assign the people, uh, the users and groups who are eventually going to need access to servers. So if I have uh, uh, demo users and scale of T operations team, uh, I would assign them as groups to the scale of T application and then these users and groups get provisioned from Okta to scale up T. This is pretty common uh, behavior for uh, applications that are integrated with Okta. Um, so you can actually push downstream to the, to the target resource, the users, and then also the groups. But because we're dealing with infrastructure access, we're actually going to take things one step further. Because when we provision from Okta to scale up T, scale up T provisions to the machines themselves. So in the scale of T dashboard, we have those same users and groups. This is still branded as scale of T. Those same users and groups with their machine IDs that are sourced via Okta, but then these are actually what, get, what gets uh, reflected on the servers themselves. And again, it's all automated. So if I were to remove a group uh, from, a, from a scale of T here um, or add a group, that gets reflected on scale of T automatically and then the, on the machines too. Now, before we uh, talk a little bit about the configuration administration, I like to show the end user experience just, just to get a uh, level set on how seamless it is to use for, for the server administrators. Now, the way it works is we have this little client application uh, that we ship for Mac, Windows, and Linux. So server administrators would install this, this application on their machine. And it's there to do just a couple things, but mostly it's just there to interface with my local SSH and RDP tools. And it comes with a helpful little CLI here. Um, so I can do a bunch of things here. I can log in to log, in, log out of Teams. I can run some basic configuration. Um, but first what I want to do is show authenticating with Okta. So I'm just going to log in to one of my Teams here. So what this is going to do, I'm already, I already have an authenticated Okta session. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to bind this to the workstation, the laptop that I'm on right now. So we talked about zero trust identity. We're talking about a user plus a device at a point in time. So this combination of user plus device gives me a strongly authenticated session that I can now use to interact with the servers. And I'll just go back to the CLI here. I just have some inventory here. Now what I want to show here is I can just use SSH like I normally would in any other environment. But through some magic of SSH, I'm actually interfacing with the local scale of T CLI. Because Ubuntu-AWS, that's not a DNS record. You wouldn't expect to be able to just use SSH with the stock SSH binary, but I'm able to. This is going to log me into a machine. So just to go back real quick, I just want to prove that this is the stock SSH binary that ships with my MacBook. But through a very nifty feature of SSH, called proxy command, I can actually use SSH, but I'm interfacing with the local SFT binary, which is the scale of T client that was installed on my workstation. So this is an incredibly easy end user experience. If I want to SSH to a machine, I just do SSH in the host name and I'm popped in. But I didn't use a key to authenticate. If you're familiar with SSH authentication, you would probably expect there to be a .SSH directory here, which would contain all the uh, uh, authorized keys uh, an authorized keys file that has all the public keys that can be used to access this machine. Because we're doing client certificate authentication, we replace that method of accessing servers. Um, also, the user account and the groups that I'm a member of, these are all sourced from Okta. 
Um, so every user that's a member of a, of a Scale T project gets created a local user account. And so if one of these users gets disabled, uh, deleted in Okta, we disable that account on the machine. Um, but we like to have local accounts because we think that's better for auditing purposes. So you can tie things to a user uh, much better than with shared accounts. This is a, a philosophical uh, component of our product. We understand a lot of people still prefer shared accounts. As an identity company, we believe in local accounts on the machine. So the way this all works is uh, when you uh, in run a, want to enroll a server with ScaleFT, you install this little agent. This is SFTD. It's a lightweight agent. I know everyone says their agent is lightweight. We actually mean it. It's only there to do a couple things. It's what creates and manages the local user and group accounts. Uh, it also captures all of the login events uh, for auditing purposes, so we, we can capture who logged into what machine and when. And also, when you install SFTD, this is key to client certificate authentication, we are configuring the local OpenSSH to trust certificates that are signed by ScaleFT. This is the certificate authority topic, uh, which is best reflected going back to our dashboard here and showing the login event uh, in our event stream. So if I were to look here, um, these login events here represent me logging in via SSH. Um, and so this is where the credential was issued. And we talked about the scope a little bit. So this is the user, which is my Okta user account. The client, which is my MacBook currently running the ScaleFT client. And then this project, ScaleFT project that contains this server. And then at this point in time. So I, I refer to this as an authorization scope. So that was the access decision that was made to grant access, but it was also the uh, credential that was used to log into the machine. So this SSH login was using the credential that has this scope. And so every time I'm authenticated and authorized, I minted a fresh credential. Again, it expires in three minutes. Um, so it's a really clean way to do things. And I mentioned that we're picking up on changes really fast. So let's just say, um, I jump back to, this is pro a project. I'll just briefly mention a project is a collection of servers and then their associated permissions. So this is the role-based access controls. If I'm a member of the ScaleFT operations team, I'm granted sudo on the server. If I'm a member of the Okta sales team, I am not. Um, so this is, we can do more fine-grained uh, machine level uh, permissions based on the group name because this is what gets pushed downstream. So right now, the, the, the Permissions are admin, sudo or non-sudo. Um, we talked about the device posturing. So we're talking about one-time authentication and authorization in the credentials that match. So let's just say, for the sake of demonstration, a very nasty zero-day hits and all of a sudden all Mac machines are deemed vulnerable. As an administrator, I can come in very quickly here and add this policy that says, for these servers only allow folks with, their window, with Windows machines and they're disencrypted. If I jump back and try to log into that same server, this time I'm unauthorized. Now, I still had my authenticated session, meaning I was still logged into uh, Okta, I was still bound to my client, but I was not authorized because I didn't meet the policies of the project. Now, let's just say that that was a false alarm. As an administrator, I can go back and remove that policy. And then if I, as a user, I can jump right back and try to log into that machine. This time it's gonna let me in. So we picked up that change really fast. So any change, think about uh, someone being removed from Okta, someone changing groups, or something related to the device. Um, you can you know, revoke a user's client and they won't be granted access. These are the types of things that we can pick up really fast. And because of the credential mechanism, uh, we will not allow that person in the next time they try to log in. So pretty cool uh, stuff. There's a lot more uh, I could obviously show here. I do want to leave room for time, but there's one slide I wanted to pull up because it's kind of core to uh, a lot of our thinking around the architecture design of this product. And this is where conversations tend to, to get, uh, get started um, because a lot of the way that we design this product is a, is a different from traditional thinking uh, of server access or your traditional thinking of privilege access. Um, but it's how we design the product. It's why we believe in this modern approach and uh, when people are behind this architecture and the, the, the decisions that we've made, this is a great product for them. So we talked about automation over manual operations. With more cloud adoption, you don't want to be stuck 
manually provisioning accounts and credentials. I think that's a, that's a no-brainer here. The more you can just configure thing, things once and let automation take over, the better. So the automation could be spinning up servers, installing the agent, uh, adding the users and groups to accounts so that those, those accounts get pushed to the machines. If all that's automated, you have a much better environment to handle scale and elasticity in the cloud versus doing this manually. This is the big one. We just believe in ephemeral credentials over static keys. Uh, we don't want to put our focus on protecting the keys. We want to drive their value down to zero. And the only way to do that is to limit their scope to a single request. That one we saw in action. Again, user identities over shared accounts. As an identity company, we believe it should be user identity led, so you know exactly who is doing what versus a way to check out shared accounts on the machines themselves. Local accounts over directory interfaces. We see this a lot in infrastructure where folks try to replicate their uh, directories on machines, either through like an LDAP uh, PAM module. Um, what that comes down to really, at, certainly at scale, is a distributed systems problem. You're syncing directories. It's a, it's a real headache uh, to build and configure and manage those directories on the machines. What if we could just push accounts locally uh, tied to a, an identity a, in a directory? That's what we believe uh, it, at Okta here. And just having local accounts on the machine is much easier to handle automation. Uh, it's much easier with auditing. You, you just don't have to do a bunch of additional operations and configurations. It's just a local account. Similarly, uh, a lot of traditional products in this space will force you to go check out a credential. Uh, out of, it's an out-of-band process. That can be painful on uh, end users. If you're in a server administrator, you want to just get in, do your job, and get out. Uh, that is much better done as a single sign-on workflow. And when you have something like Okta uh, at the core of SSO, this is very streamlined. You saw it. I just did SSH to the host name, and I was in. Pretty slick. Uh, it's just a much better experience for, for the end users. Uh, Role-based access over privilege escalation. This one is can be contentious. Um, there's a lot of folks who uh, believe that a lot of the privileges should be handled on the machine. And when you log into that machine, uh, depending on the surrounding context, you can assume certain privileges on that machine. We believe, uh, again, with a unified identity and central access controls, that policy should be in a central place. And the more that you can bring policy into your access controls in a unified manner, the easier it's going to be for you as a manager uh, of those policies to have the confidence that they're, they're being adhered to. Uh, because if you have a bunch of different policies in different locations, it's really hard to keep track of what's actually being enforced. And the more that you can get that into a unified uh, location, the, just the easier it is from a management perspective, uh, but also an adherence perspective. You know, a written policy that's not enforceable in practice isn't very valuable. Uh, and the only way to really do that is to kind of centralize the controls. And doing that in, a, in an RBAC kind of environment where you can clearly attribute a user to their roles, uh, we just believe that is better than on-demand escalating privileges. It's just one of those, one of those product decisions. This is a, a, we got a lot of networking folks here, I'm sure. So this is one we believe uh, in cloud architectures, uh, when you're trying to protect private instances instead of locking things down with the VPN, is designing a bastion architecture. And this is something that we support as a first class citizen in this new product, where you can configure private instances to hop through bastions automatically. And it's all streamlined. I can just do SSH to the target machine. If the bastion is configured, it'll just hop right through. Uh, we will make mint credentials for each one of those servers and authentication attempts. Uh, but to the user, you're just logging in uh, to the target machine. And it's just much easier to configure bastions as uh, you know, lightweight, uh, highly available jump boxes uh, versus having to go through VPNs in, in these environments. Again, we're missing, you know, we want to make contextual access decisions uh, at the application layer. Things get things can get bogged down at that VPN layer. Uh, we see it more and more. Companies are trying to eliminate as much of uh, VPN usage for, for company uh, traffic as they can because it's a, it's a pain point for a lot of folks dealing with cloud, mobile, and remote workers. And finally, um, this is a fun one, uh, structured logs over session recordings. Now, uh, traditional privilege access products uh, will, will do a lot of uh, recordings of actual sessions so you can see uh, which commands were entered, but usually they're done in some form of video format. So my joke here is you would have to absolutely run out of Netflix to ever want to go back and watch RDP sessions. Um, but let's talk about it from a security outcome perspective. What you really want to know is you want to know who did what on what machine and when. 
Now, that information is better as a structured log because you can search on it, uh, you can alert on it, you have the information coming in um, to, if you have a SIM tool, if you have a logging tool, it can come in and the more structured it is, the, the more effective you can be in responding to that. So it's not just some uh, potential forensics analysis piece of data that sits there and collects dust. Um, it's something you can actually uh, be actionable with. And so if you have alerting in place for you know, users that you might not ex expect from different locations, different machines, that's, that stuff coming in as a structured log um, is, is more effective or specific commands that you kind of want to filter. So a lot of this is, um, you know, why we built the product the way we did. And I usually think this is a good uh, place to open things up for questions because this is, can be contentious. Um, there's a lot of strong opinions on how some of these products should work. Uh, we have ours. I'm sure you might have yours. So, Brian, are there any, uh, any questions? Yeah, thanks, Ivan. Uh, just a reminder, everyone, we have that Q&A box. Go ahead and type it out there. Uh, if you have any questions for us. So uh, first question, uh, does this work with uh, multi-factor authentication with MFA? Yes, this is a good quest question. So if, you, if you've ever used Okta multi-factor authentication before, um, I'll jump back to the, the demo, you'll know that it is a sign-on policy between uh, Okta and then the application. So because ScaleFT is a separate application that, that controls access to servers, if I were to add an MFA sign-on policy, um, here, if I were to add this, this would be, oops, how do I enable it? Um, there we go. Uh, this would be between me logging into ScaleFT, um, but not necessarily me logging in every SSH or RDP attempt. Now, the way I like to talk about this is what you want out of multi-factor authentication is a strongly authenticated session um, that you can then carry through to, to a target resource. Now, if I were a server administrator, I probably wouldn't want to be, to be forced to uh, MFA every time I typed SSH. But what I would want would be to that strongly authenticated user plus device session with an MFA in, and then every SSH attempt is, auth authentic, is authorized. So let me, I can probably demonstrate this if I do SFT log out. Um, I think that should do it. If I do SFT login, so this might pop me back. Oh, I still had my authenticated Octa session. Um, let me see here. Okay. Yeah, I would have to. Well, I'll just talk through it. Um, it is because of that authorization where we have the. Oh, it looks like I've got some people doing some things. Um, this is the authorization, the issued credential, the scope. Um, but the, the MFA is, on, is carried through as the authenticated Okta session. So um, long-winded way, long -winded way of saying it's, it's a sign-on policy, yes, between Okta and scale fees and application, but not necessarily every individual will log into a server. Uh, just a follow-up question on that. For example, yeah. what if uh, the, they suddenly changed? They were logging in California, and they just logged in from China. Would that force it to uh, use multi-factor? Right. Good question. Um, it would not by default um, because, again, if you still had that strongly authenticated Okta session, um, ScaleFT would, would not necessarily re-authenticate on every time. Um, so this is actually something on the product side where we're looking to, to do more in is right now it's kind of a Okta to scale of T, scale T to machine type of authentication workflow where all the authorization happens via scale of T, but the authentication happens via Okta. So if there's things that we can do on the sign-on policy, and on Okta is investing heavily in, in this area where we can do things like um, you know, understanding impossible travel, which is, I think that that's what that use case might be. It would be physically impossible for someone to log in from California and then from, you know, Boston uh, seconds later. So we can pick that up in Okta, but we need to find a way to carry that through into, into scale up T. So I think there's some product investment areas uh, on that front, but certainly core Okta is investing heavily, heavily in that. Uh, but what we don't necessarily want to do is uh, over overstep on that authenticated Okta session 
one year servant administrator trying to get to uh, get to the machines. The more device posturing and dynamic authorization, uh, we want to we want to do the policy enforcement independently of the authentication. Um, so the authentication will be Okta. Policy enforcement will be you know the device, the uh, role-based access controls, and any, any of the access policies. But this is all big product investment of unifying the experience. Um, even though it will be rebranded, we still do plan to have this as a separate dashboard. This is going to form the kind of foundation of an Okta for infrastructure uh, console. Um, so right now we have servers, but we're investing in other resource targets. So it will still be a separate dashboard, but we do want to unify some of the uh, user group management and authentication pieces. Okay, great. Another question. How long does the current authenticated session last? In other words, is there a timeout setting to configure for each authenticated session? Yeah, that's that's configurable. Um, I think the default default is nine hours, um, but you can definitely tighten that up um, on the scale of T side. Does that mean um, that you don't now have to go configure all of your servers to have a, uh, a you know a termination time? You can just have it be kind of uh, global. Right. So that is essentially um, that is purely the authentication piece again. And so. Uh, the, the authenticated session will last by default uh, by, for 10 hours. But every, every login is independently authorized. Um, and also, if you have a bunch of active sessions and let's say your, your, the policy changes or the RBAC changes, we're going to pick up on that right away and the agent on the machine uh, will terminate that session. So it, it's basically carrying through that authenticated session for a duration but any changes are immediately reflected. Does that mean that if we terminate someone, for example, and terminate them out of Okta, they would be immediately, uh, all those sessions would be killed right then and there? Yes, near instantly. Um, there's a provisioning from Okta to scale up T. The, the agent, the SFTD agent that's running on the machine is polling our, our API every 30 seconds for any changes. And if it notices a change, it reflects that on the machine uh, right away. So you got within a minute of someone being terminated inside of Okta uh, to, to have their sessions being disabled. Okay, so you could even expand that to, you know, if someone was compromised or something like that, we could very easily understand those sessions and, and get rid exactly. of them right away. Yep, exactly. Okay. Next question. Uh, you mentioned AWS and Azure, but what about on-premise servers? Yeah. Um, so it... Because it's agent-based, really our only actual core hardcore requirement is the agent runs on the machine and has outbound port 443 access to our back end. That means you can provision the agent on on-prem deployments. Now, there are some networking considerations depending on uh, you know how locked down your on-prem environments are. We've, we've just found most of our customers are, are more cloud native, but we're dealing with a lot of on-prem deployments as well. Uh, it just has that hard requirement of, of port 443 outbound access to our back end so it can communicate to, for all of those uh, user group changes and, and event logging. Um, but yeah, definitely available for, for on-prem deployments, just not air-gapped networks. <laughs> all right, so you showed the stock SSH client, but does it work with other clients like uh, Putty? It does, yeah. Um, I don't have Putty on this machine, but one thing I can do is I can show it with... Uh, with RDP to a Windows machine. I think I've got one here. Um, so basically, we'll interface with any any tool um, that can use, that has SSH or RDP as the underlying protocol. Now, you saw me do SSH. I could just do SSH without doing SFT. RDP doesn't have the same cool uh, capability, so I actually have to preface it with SFT. And that just popped, I had a local RDP client. This is a Mac free RDP um, that, that, that just popped open. Again, you can see this is my Okta account. I'm a local account administrator uh, on this machine. So you can configure the SFT, uh, which is the scale T client, to interact with basically any tool that uses SSH or RDP as a transport. Um, so it could be SFT, uh, I'm sorry, SFTD, SCP, a lot of those types of uh, tools work pretty well. Okay, next question. Can I block based on geography, IP address wise? Yeah, good question. Um, so that would be a function of the sign-on policy at the uh, Okta level. Um, so you could have a, I believe I have a sign-on policy here. 
let's see if I have all the feature flags. So there's some location in zone, not in zone. There's, uh, I think there's some feature flags that we need to enable to be very granular and specific about this. But you can create zones inside of Okta. They can be network zones. Um, I think they can be IP range as well. Uh, that would be, again, a sign-on rule a policy between Okta and ScaleT as an application. So if you didn't meet that sign-on policy, you could never authenticate into ScaleFT to then log into servers. So anything that's applied to as a sign-on rule uh, gets carried through that authenticated Okta session. Now you'll, you see some of these client rules, and you saw some of the client rules on ScaleFT here. Um, I don't know if I showed full of this, but we have some client rules here, and then there are some client rules here. This is, again, areas of integration um, where we're probably going to leverage a lot of core Okta from a device trust perspective and carry that through as well. Right now, it's a little bit of duplication because we'd, we'd invested in some of this uh, at ScaleFT, um, but Okta is also investing in this. And so there's things like, you know, different, different devices, uh, device, trusted devices. So this is something around managed devices. We've got a lot of partners with uh, MDM vendors. Uh, where you could say, you know, only managed devices uh, can have access to, to, to machines. So there's going to be a lot of investment in that area uh, as well. So network location device are really the three areas of context that we're adding more capabilities to. Okay, great. That's all our questions. Um, uh, Ivan, I'd like to thank you very much for, for showing up and uh, uh, giving us this presentation today. It's, it's very exciting for me. I really like uh, kind of what I'm seeing here. And gentlemen, thanks for joining us today. Anything um, you want to add before we close this up? So I'll just throw out there, um, if anyone wants to have a further conversation, you know, this was just to spark some interest. Uh, if you want to have a one-on-one -on -one demo, if you want to kick the tires on this and do a proof of concept, um, if you just want to have a conversation, you know, please let it, uh, me know or, or your salesperson know, um, and we'll be happy to set that up. And, you know, again, I really appreciate Ivan uh, giving us a run-through of that today. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it.